Amen. I salute each and every one with the awesome and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you tonight, tonight, tonight. We are still in the book of Revelation. And tonight we are in chapter 6 of Revelation that I've entitled The Four Horsemen and the Seven Seals. Amen. Tonight is part three of a series for the book of Revelation and a continuation of chapter six. For those who may be new coming to uh, the Bible study and getting these words and my voice in your hearing as the oracle on God's behalf this evening, uh, we have been taking an adventure through the book of Revelation. Amen. However, for who I am in God, there's another anointed level that God has revealed some things to me uh, that has put it in a uh, prophetic realm of understanding. Amen. Uh, when we began, if I can just kind of give you a quick recap of the previous chapters for those who may be new. When you visit chapter one, and let me first say the word revelation itself, the book, uh, the word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. Apocalypsis means to reveal or to unveil or to have unveiled. All right. And the reason I articulate that is as I taught chapter one of Revelation and gave the history of the book, uh, I brought to many people's attention that there's actually two Greek words uh, for Revelation. There's apocalypsis that I've just given to you and apocalypto. Apocalypto is something being revealed to you in the now. Just like prayerfully as we began to get into the scriptures on tonight and something uh, comes like a light bulb to you or a V8 moment and you go, ah, that's what we call an apocalypto. It's something that you're getting in the moment or something that just happens. Apocalypsis is something that has already happened, but now it's, it's being written out or it's being articulated on. Amen. Just like John wrote the book of Revelation in 95, 96 AD. Well, right now we're in the year 2015. So it was a revealing or an unveiling that has already occurred, but it was being written down. Amen. Just like in the same term when we talk about the Gospels. Uh, Mark is the first Gospel that it was written. However, the Gospels weren't being written in the moment that Jesus was walking the earth. Uh, the Gospels were being written, uh, 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 at least the book of Mark, 40 years after Christ ascended. So that kind of gives you an idea or a thought to put in your head. Amen. So in that we got into the understanding of what revelation really is. And then you transition into understanding chapter one. Chapter one begins to say this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. What, what I, I give everybody as, a, as a, uh, a prophetic station break is this is the book that tells you how to date, how to court, how to come into relationship relationship with Christ. The Gospels gave the walk of the man, but this is the book that tells you how he ticks. This is the book that tells you uh, what is the inside of Christ, a man that the Gospels didn't give. So it says, uh, blessed is he that readeth this book. All right. This is the book that brings the blessing or this is the book. When we understand the word blessing, it means beneficial. It, it's a benefit to you. Uh, uh, the book of Revelation becomes an add to your life, not a takeaway. Uh, unfortunately, many of us in, in uh, the Christendom have allowed the devil to be successful because a lot of folks still steer clear of the book of Revelation. Everybody say, oh, that's the book of doom and gloom. No, that's the book of power and boom. This is the book that really gets into the intricate uh, uh, things of the spirit and the understanding of who Christ is. So with that chapter one now transitions into giving us descriptions of who Christ is chapter one through chapter two. They begin to define who he is uh, uh, in different identities. You know, 
hair as sheep's wool, eyes as flames of fire, feet are like bronze, in his hands having the candlesticks. So there, there is a, a, a physical description that John is permitted to give as to the spiritual Christ in the heavenlies. And then John begins to transition from describing Christ to now giving a letter to the angels of the seven churches. Now what we got in clear understanding uh, as I continue to articulate this, please don't get it twisted. When you look at the word angel, it is not exclusive to sentient beings that have wings as everybody is associated every time they read the word angel. What is here, the word angel in the Greek is agalos, which means messenger. Okay, so that can apply to a a uh, human being in this context just as much as it can apply to a sentient being. Why do I say this? Because nobody has ever known of a sentient being pastoring a church. The seven churches uh, are being pastored or overseen by angels or i.e. individuals that were put in place. Watch this. All of them were spiritual sons to John the Revelator. So there's connection. Christ begins to give him a critique of them in order to help them continue to manage the churches that they're pastoring or overseeing in order for them to move forward and advance in the things that uh, they have been called to do. The letters let you know what they're doing good. The letters let you know what they were doing wrong. And the letters also gave them as leaders what, what God or Christ desires for them to adjust in order to lead the people. Because please excuse me for the expression, but we use that, that old world cliche, monkey see, monkey do. I'm not calling people a monkey, but hear what I'm saying. When it comes to the body of Christ, a lot of folks don't know what God looks like other than looking to the leaders that they're seeking to follow. So here with these pastors or leaders, they're the ones that people are watching to see what right looks like. Amen. So in that Christ knows that they're committed unto uh, uh, the leaders that they've been given. So they're the ones that's got to make an adjustment. So we began to understand that when we dissected the letters that was was given to the leaders of the seven churches. Now, from that point, it brings us up to chapter four, where John seen the door in the beginning of chapter four. We understood God says, come up hither or he gave a, 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 a command for John to come up or climb up or excel itself up higher. But here's the thing. We, we were deposited the revelation that the door wasn't simply a door like we know with a, 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 a knob and hinges on it. The word door comes from the Greek word thura, which means opportunity. So now John begins to transition us, watch this, from physical things because chapter 1 through chapter 3 is, is things dealing with the flesh. It's dealing with folks. It's dealing with our natural. It had to deal with what John's connections were in the natural for spiritual things, i.e. with the churches that he had placed leadership in place. So now God says, I'm taking you to a higher place and now fixing to show you some spiritual things. So chapter four, we begin to have a transition of spiritual things in God. And when I talk about the transition, John now begins to start describing things that were in the throne room. He, 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 he describes to us there are four living creatures or four, four beasts, amen. And what I brought to many's attention, when we look at that, that, that word beast, it comes from the Greek word zone, D-Z-O-O-N, which only means living being. So here we get a revelation that apparently there's four living beings, meaning uh, 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 entities that's got flesh to them more so than just spirit. Everything else that's going on in heaven, as we know, God is a spirit. We know Christ is in the spiritual. However, we've gotten a description of him that's natural so we can wrap our finite minds around it. But then we begin to get a description of four beings that are there. So what I'm really telling you, John wasn't the only one at the party who was still tied to flesh. Not, John is not the only one that, that, that had a shell on himself in this place, in a higher place in God. 
In the same turn, we also get the revelation that there were 24 elders. Uh, elders was talking about those who were senior. Uh, now, as I said before, and I'm not going to create a, 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 a something to give somebody a ooh and an ah on the line, but the thing is, we don't have enough in the writings to declare who the 24 were. All we know is that there were 24 there. And in that, throughout this entire time, we've got the revelation that, that this book was more about hearing than it was seeing. Even though John is giving us everything almost in a panoramic view, because as we begin to look at the chapters continually in the book of Revelation, you begin to discover that uh, almost every verse begins with the word and. So it's a continuous thought, it's a continuous vision that John is seeing. But, but he begins to give us a descri description and he talks about voices and he talks about sound. And what we also get a, a, a revelation on is when he talks about uh, a voice in the book of Revelation, it came from the Greek word phone, P-H-O-N-E, which is talking about sound or tones or vibrations of sound uh, or reverberation that comes through an instrument. Okay, so that's going on in the background. So in that, John begins to describe to us as we go on to chapter 5 about the elders and, and, and the four beasts bowing down and worshiping the lamb. The lamb being the only one strong enough to open the book. Meaning he was the only one that was qualified that had the credentials because of the innocent sacrifice that he had made for mankind. Uh, 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 as we would say in the spiritual altar by being on the cross, it made him valid in order to open the book. Then we transition now into chapter 6. Chapter 6 is the chapter that we're at now. And, and what, what, what's going on right now is the fact that John is dealing with the seven seals. John is having the beast come to him and say, let us show you something. And in this, he's, he's beginning to transition from one seal to another. Now, brup, let me bag up. And, and, and say this to you, because some that may not have been here on the previous teaching may have not have caught this. But when, jo when John is taken uh, 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 to see these seals, before that, what is articulated in his hearing is these are the seven spirits from before the throne. All right. Now, as we talk the seven spirits, for those that are still Bible readers, when you go back to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it names seven identities, or watch this, seven characteristics of what we really call the Holy Spirit. Even though Paul has articulated in the New Testament that we're all sealed with the Holy Spirit, the thing is, right now, John is given a revelation of how to describe it. Amen. What, what, what's, what's deep in that is the fact that, you know, we as, as, as believers, uh, uh, we are very quick to tell folks that I've got the Holy Spirit. But if somebody asks you the question, well, can you describe it for me? Uh, right now, many folks will just say, uh, no, it's just a feeling that you got. I, I, I can't describe it, but it's just a feeling. Well, the thing is, the Spirit, we can have it. But the thing is, can we articulate it and put it into action the way that it's supposed to operate? This is now the revelation that we're getting with the seals. The seals are seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And you know, it's, it, you know, I tell some people it's just like going to Baskin Robbins. Baskin Robbins got 31 flavors, but it's all ice cream. No matter what, 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 what flavor it is, it's still the root of it is that it's ice cream. So the Holy Spirit is still the Holy Spirit, but it has some characteristics in it that now are being articulated. So we began to, to transition into that by the first four of them being uh, articulated as horsemen going forth from the throne. The horsemen, you know, if, if I may say this, if anybody that's on the line is a historian, they would know this. The horse was something that symbolized power and it symbolized speed uh, uh, and it symbolized authority. That's why when we go back to the time of Moses, it was the Egyptian pharaohs that had chariots. Uh, uh, it was the Romans and it was the Greeks. All of them had chariots and the chariots of the leader symbolized somebody that had power 
power and authority and they had quickness. So now we begin to get a revelation. If, if the seven spirits are identities that are connected to the Holy Spirit, then it's already implying to us that it goes forth, one, with power and authority. Number two, it goes forth quickly. It, 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 is, it is not hindered in the force of the power that it moves forward in. So John is seeing this, and he begins by describing to us, first of all, the first horse that's dispatched. And see, let, 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 let me say this again and put it in your hearing for those who were on the previous teaching and those who are new. As it is dispatched, keep in mind what I said. These are the seven spirits that came or were dispatched from God. So the first one is the white horse going forth conquering and to conquer. As I brought to your attention previously, white here comes from the Greek word leukos, which doesn't necessarily mean the color white, but it implies illumination. It implies brightness. It, 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 it implies uh, 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 something that's lit up. So this identity or characteristic of the Holy Spirit is going forth with power and illumination. And it says that it has a crown, which comes from the Greek word Stephanos, which means uh, uh, it, it has been uh, uh, sealed with authority or anointing. All right. This kind of kills what some theologies that are out there that says that the first horse rider is the Antichrist. Well, uh, uh, why would the Antichrist be identified as one of the seven spirits that's always with God in heaven? Amen? So we, 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 we get an understanding about, about the first one is the horse going forth and it's going forth to conquer and to conquer. Then we transition into the, 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 the second uh, identity or the second horse, which is red, which is symbolic of the color of God himself. Because the word fire that's used there, when, it, when it's translated uh, uh, out of the Greek, it, it, it comes from the word pure host, which means the color of fire. All right. Jesus was described in Revelation chapter one as eyes as flames of fire. In the Old Testament, God says he's a consuming fire. Uh, 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 in the same turn, if, if we even uh, articulate and we entertain Moses and the burning bush, he has an encounter with God. So God is still being implied here. And this horse rider goes forth with a sword. As I gave a revelation before, the sword ties itself. Self, not to a physical sword that somebody got uh, uh, from the days of chivalry. We're talking about the word of God itself and what comes out of your mouth. If that's not so, in the book of James, it says there's power in the tongue. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 16, Christ was described as a sword coming out of his mouth, which when you really go to the mirror and take a look at your tongue, that's why it curves in and comes to a point. That's where we get the concept of a double-edged sword. So the sword is symbolized, symbolizing the word, and it's symbolizing what comes out of your mouth. This is where power comes, because in James chapter 3, it says life and death is in the tongue. So we, we began to get an understanding with the second horse rider. Then, then, then we begin to move to the third horse rider, the one that was black that has the scales in its hand. And as we, as we began to dig into that, we begin to understand that um, the, the, the scale meant more than uh, just uh, 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 like we see with the, the Lady Justice. Amen. The scale, when it was translated out of Greek, its first meaning means a yoke. So it means that it's something that is bore on, on one. But in the same turn, if we articulate it as to the scale for weighing, the thing was, this thing is about us being bartered. The spirit goes forward in order to make us be aware that there's judgment that should be going on in us constantly in the earth realm as long as we're tied to the Holy Spirit. See, understand, some folks are still saying uh, uh, salvation was free. No, it's not. Salvation requires your soul in return because if Christ uh, uh, paid the price on Calvary or redeemed us, it's because we were bartered. It meant that he paid in advance in order for you to repay the debt. So 
in that there's some things that's got to die in you in the process and there's some judgments that have to come that's why even in the book of Job chapter 31 verse 6 he talks about balances being used for our integrity Proverbs 11 1 is about fault the, uh, 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 the balances and, and of our life where we're not found to be an abomination before God so the balances is either for us to be justified or an abomination that is something that's in the Holy Spirit that we are always, as the word says, examining ourselves, which brought us to the thing about now the transition of, uh, of the wheat and the barley and the tithe of the penny and so forth. Because now it brings us back to understanding and tying ourselves to what was going on with communion. Amen. So, as I've given that little quick synopsis and crash course, it brings us tonight to verse 7 of the book of Revelation. Amen. So, for those of you that's got the word with you, please turn with me to Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. And it says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. All right. So, now, once again, what's going on? Christ is breaking open the seals. Christ is breaking open one by one each dimension or each characteristic of the Holy Spirit. And it says, when he had opened the fourth seal, and keep in mind, the word seal comes from the Greek word sphragis, which means signet or stamp impressed on the forehead. Amen. Because remember, I said from chapter four thereafter, everything is spiritual, not natural. So what, what, what we're trying to get you into a place of, of, of realizing and fitting yourself in the shoes of what goes on with the spirit and the revelation that you need is that this is about breaking open the spirit that you've been sealed with. So now he says the fourth one is broken open. Then he says, and I heard the voice. I heard the phone. I heard the sound. I heard the instrument that was reverberating or repeating something. Uh, uh, and so when he heard the, 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 the voice or the sound that was being reverberated out of the fourth beast or the fourth living being that was in the heavenlies, he said, come and see. Now, in that, let me place this in your hearing again. As he says, come and see, the thing is, uh, uh, as the scripture says, say, the word say comes from the Greek word lego, which means an expression of what's being spoken. So watch this. The fourth beast, as it is telling John to come and see, he, he, th 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 this, this being is not only talking to John or making a sound. He's also putting into motion his body uh, 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 by even bringing the motion. Come on. Y'all know like if you was going to the park and somebody says, come on, come with me. And they begin to wave their arms and so forth. That means they're giving an expression to go along with what they say so that a person doesn't misinterpret what they're hearing. They're also seeing the motion that goes along. Because remember, like I said here, this thing wasn't just about what you see. It was also about what you hear. Because hearing and seeing have to go together and validate themselves. A lot of folks see some things, but they don't see what they thought they saw. And they have to confirm it by hearing what matches what they see. See, that's why the word even tells us about uh, not being two-faced. About, 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 you know... Uh, uh, double minded and so forth. You know, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Why? Why is that so? Other than the fact that it's implying the fact that you say one thing, but your body does another. All right. So so what the scripture is is implying is that he's not only doing the motion, he's speaking the same thing, speaking the same language for John to make sure that he's understanding the command that's being given. So now it brings us to verse eight. And he says, and I looked and behold, meaning I saw and I was able to, to examine. I, I took time and he said, I seen a pale horse. All right. Now, the word pale comes from the Greek word chloros. Chloros means green. So John says, I seen a green horse. 
Now, let me let me, let me uh, 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 really bring something here to you to your attention. What I found very interesting is the fact that John articulates that this horse was green. Now, the word that's used here is chloros versus smaragados. Smaragados is green, but it attaches itself to the emerald. Amen. For those that are that are really listening right now. Uh, uh, if you were in Revelation chapter 4 verse 3, the scripture says that there was a rainbow that was round about the throne as an emerald. All right. Emerald is green. However, let me give you a revelation. Chloros is green solid. All right. Emerald or smaragados is green transparent. Okay. I hope I gave somebody something. Two forms of green, one is solid that you, you, you can't see through, the other one is one that you can. Same thing with uh, uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 19, we haven't gotten there, but what's interesting is that it talks about the foundations of the holy city, and it says the fourth foundation was as of emerald. And what's real deep, what's real deep that I'm hoping I'm really giving somebody something here just in this thing about colors here. What is interesting is once again, this is the fourth seal being opened and it's the fourth beast that's implying this. All right. And in the same turn of Revelation 21, like I just said, the, the emerald or the color green is the fourth foundation of the city. Now, still moving on. All right. It says, and his name, now, make sure you're still holding on to this. The word name is anoma in Greek, which means character. Character or authority or, or designation. So, the green horse rider has the character, all right? So, it says, his name or character that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him. All right? Death is thanatos, which means death of the body. Hear what I'm saying? Because until until the judgment comes for eternity, this is not speaking of death of the spirit. Amen because even as we get later into the book of Revelation, let me let me validate that, bag that up for you. If this is talking about the spirit, then Revelations 19 becomes a lie because it talks about the white throne judgment of some uh, uh, being judged uh, uh, for damnation and some being judged uh, uh, for eternal life. Amen. In the same turn, when you go to Daniel, Daniel uh, chapter 12 says some will lie, rise to everlasting uh, 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 life and some will will. Uh, remain in everlasting damnation. So there's a judgment that occurs. Here, what's being talked about is there is a death that occurs to the flesh. All right? And in that, it says, and hell followed. Now, the word hell comes from the Greek word Hades, which means the lower region or lower compartment. All right? But now let me give you a real revelation. Even when we talk about hell, hell is, is a separation from God. That's the reality of it because even when we talk about those that will, will burn in hell fire, they're forever being separated from God. So catch this. He says here that he that sat on this horse, the character of him was to bring forth physical death or death to the flesh, or death to the human nature, and in that separation was going to follow, separating that from God. Okay? Then the scripture says, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. Now, let's, let's, let's still get a little deeper in this. Here it says power was given to death and hell. However, let me make sure that you're grabbing this because in the previous parts of the book, we talked about the word power. We can't be willy lump lump 
and think just because the word power is used here, we're talking about the same thing. There's two Greek words for power. There's dunamis and there's exousia. Dunamis is the power that you've got now to do your own bodily functions, do what you want to without you necessarily having to wake up and pray to God to ask him to be able to do it. Most of us don't have to uh, uh, wake up in the morning and ask God, can I yawn? Can I open my eyes? Can I put my feet on the floor and walk to the bathroom? That's dunamis power. That's power that's already been invested in you or given to you to be a steward or lord over. The other term, however, is what Paul called the higher power, which is the Greek word exousia, which is a power that implies influence. Okay, power of choice. Okay, so here in this scripture, in Revelations 6, 8, the word power that's being used here is exousia, not dunamis. So it says that death and hell had the power of influence given unto them and this power was over the fourth part of the earth. Now, fourth part is interesting as well because the Greek word that's used is tetartos. Alright? How, how similar does that sound to Tartarus? Tartarus, tetartos. Okay, so death and hell made a fourth part of the world become as if it was a hell. All right, it, 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 it's implying there was a separation uh, 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 of the earth as if it became as hell. Oh, watch this. Let me take that back because for some they may get that, that twisted. Earth comes from the Greek word gi, which means land. So we're, we're not talking about the whole planet. We're talking about the land mass that people walk on. Okay, so it says that when, when this characteristic of the spirit was released into the earth, it began to cause death and separation, and those things were as if they were in a hell. Amen? You know, that's just like as Christ had died on the cross, you know, and as we understand, uh, uh, going through hell. If he had to go through hell, there's a hell that, that we are still having to experience even here with what we're dealing with. Amen? So now, the verse continues and it says, uh, uh, A fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and hunger and with death and with beasts of the earth. All right, let me still slow it down and really give you a revelation here. All right, it says they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill. Hear what I'm saying? Meaning to slay with sword. Once again, remember the word sword is ramphaya, which means a, a, a sword. However, I mean, we've got the revelation since we're in, in spiritual, this is being uh, killed by the word. All right? Hunger is talking about famine. Because it, it comes from the word limos, which means famine. And then it says with death or separation and with beings of the earth. Meaning, uh, uh, beast or beings, meaning human beings. So what has happened is that we become killers of our own even by the word of God that we speak out of our mouth. Okay, let me, let me bring a real revelation. I have an aha moment. Right now, we have a lot of people that are doing that now. They're killing folks with the word of God because they have not been trained in it and they're using it like a loose cannon. Amen. Anybody can go to Walden Brooks and Walmart and buy a Bible and then jump in there, find a verse or two. And without without uh, uh, rightfully dividing the word of truth, we begin to get, as we say, holier than thou and then start using the word to cut up folks and judge folks based on the word without us having a foundation of understanding of it on our own. All right. Or, or, or having a revelation. See, that's just like for those out there that's listening that, that, that are prior service military. Nobody went out on the weapons range. No drill sergeant or no instructor let anybody go shoot a weapon unless you was first trained how to use the weapon. 
You, you, you had a class on, on, on what the weapon done, what its effective range is, uh, uh, about the safety, etc. Then you had to learn how to take it apart and put it back together. And then, after you were efficient in your knowledge of the effect, the power, uh, uh, everything about the weapon, then you were trusted to be able to be taken to a range to learn how to qualify with it. All right. So, so in that, there's a lot of people that have not been qualified. Hear what I'm saying? I ain't saying that everybody can't read the word of God. Everybody has their right to get it. But the thing is, there has to be a qualification that goes along with it in order to effectively use it the way it should be used. So in that, what happens here, there are some deaths that are being occurred uh, uh, due to the fact of misuse of the word. Deep thing, deep thing. Now, here, here's something else for you. Here's, here, here's something else for you. Watch this. This thing about the sword also links itself to famine. It's the way God operates. Amen? For those of you that's got the word of the Lord with you, Turn with me uh, uh, for a quick moment to Jeremiah chapter 24. I'm going to show you some things to bag, bag some stuff up. Jeremiah chapter 24. All right. Now, let's look at uh, verse 10. Jeremiah 24 verse 10, it says, And I will send the sword and famine. All right. So these are partners. The sword comes with famine. He says, I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Hmm. Interesting. And how funny it is that this almost sounds like shades of Revelation chapter 6. Okay, let, 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 let's turn to another. Turn over to chapter 44 of Jeremiah. Because what you will find is a lot of things that John was given in the book of Revelation is revalidated by already being spoken into the atmosphere prophetically in the Old Testament. But now you'll be able to tie it together what was really going on. When you turn to Jeremiah chapter 44, let's look at, at uh, uh, verse, uh, let's look at verse 11. Jeremiah 44, verse 11. It says, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will set my face against you for evil and to cut off all Judah. Okay, I'm going to set my face against you. What, what, why would God set his face against you other than there being some things that are unrighteous within you that need to be judged? Oh, remember, uh, the previous horse comes forth with judgment. Ah, uh, before that horse, we had the horse that came forth with the sword. And all these are the characteristics of the Holy Spirit that was identified in Isaiah chapter 11, okay? And these are the same ones that came from the throne, all right? Verse 12, and I will take the remnant of Judah and have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by famine. They shall die from the least even unto the greatest by the sword and by the famine. Wow. Even here in Jeremiah, they keep implying the sword and the famine. Here in Revelation chapter 6, it talks about the sword and famine or hunger. All right. Then it says, and they shall be an exoration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. When we say exoration, we mean they're uh, uh, cursed based on an oath. Meaning God made an oath that anybody that violates this is going to be cursed. Astonishment means a waste or desolate, meaning they're not worth anything. Curse, of course, means a curse. And then reproach means they become a disgrace and they're taunted at or scorned or rebuked because of their shame. Verse 13, for I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. So that none of the remnant of Judah 
which are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall escape or remain that they should return into the land of Judah. Now, uh, uh, as we begin to look at this, uh, have some of you even made the connection? Oh, wow. Jesus was the lion of Judah. If we're supposed to be like him, this is talking about the family that's connected to him. So the body of Christ is looking to uh, uh, replicate the line of Judah or the tribe of Judah since Christ is the lion or the lead king of Judah. And this scripture is talking about Judah not being able to go uh, uh, into land and being killed off. Hear me. To, uh, to the which they have a desire to return to the well there. For none shall return, but such as shall escape. So they're not meant to return, but they are meant to escape. Amen. Now, please turn with me over to the book of Amos. Book of Amos, chapter 8. I know we're, we're getting there of the time. Amos, chapter 8, verse 11. It says, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but the hearing of the words of the Lord. All right. So what happens is the word is being misused and it's killing folks to now dilute the word. So now people are, are becoming anorexic because they're not getting the true word. Because the word that they've been getting has been misused. It's been misused, abused, mistranslated, contorted, distorted. And now it is caused reprobation or reprobate mind for those who hear it where now folks don't even want to receive it because it's already been tainted. The highest been given by those who, who have had the authority to go forth with it, but they've misused it. It's a deep word. Deep word. So then, verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, all right, and once again the word seal, uh, uh, phragus, stamp or impression on the forehead, which is symbolic of spirit being broken open. He says, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, what, what, what's deep here is he says, I saw when, when the seal is, when the next seal is open, after the damage has been done with the word, because the spirit is sim symbolizing how it's, it's been misused, it says that under the altar, now, and an altar in the Greek is called Thusiasteron, which is a place where victims are slayed. All right? Not guilty parties. This is an altar for victims. Just like when it came to the temples when they gave sacrifices of lambs or sheep or bullock or so forth, they hadn't done nothing to nobody. So they were innocent and were given as a sacrifice. All right. So what is interesting here is he, he says, I saw under and I'm implying something here. I want you to catch this. This is I saw under the altar, the souls or the spirits of them that were slain or slaughtered innocently for the word. Or should I say through or with or by the word? Hear what I'm saying? Chapter eight or, or verse eight talks about the word being used and death happening and separations and stuff occurring. But then in, in, in verse 9, it now articulates that the souls that got slaughtered innocently were slaughtered by the word. All right? It says the word of God. All right? And for the testimony or the witness of the report which they held or possessed or owned. Did not get to give away, did not get to give out. It was a testimony that was still in them that was never released. All right. Now, here's something I want to tie to that. It's probably going to mess somebody up that's listening. And like I said, I know we're, 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 we're right there at the time. But turn with me to Leviticus. 
Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17. All right. And I want to take a moment. Look at verse 10. And it says, And who, whosoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. Verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Oh, wait a minute. Let me, brrr, let me bag that up. Y'all got to make a connection here. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Meaning my flesh can't even operate unless I've got blood. The secret ingredient to my body working for me is in the blood that's pumping through the body. Alright? So it says life is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. So my, my life force that's in my blood is to atone for my unrighteousness. But it's done on the altar or it comes up on the altar. Here in this scripture in Revelation chapter 6 verse 9, it says the blood that's under the altar, not upon the altar or that comes up or upon the altar. So John says, I saw some blood that was still waiting under the altar. It had not been atoned for as of yet. It was waiting for the opportunity to manifest or come up on the altar in order for it to atone or pay the price or be justified. Hear what I'm saying. Verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So the blood is needed in order to bring balance and validation and justification, sanctification for the soul, especially for those that have been sacrificed unrighteously. So basically, they were almost in the same, same category as Christ himself, dying innocently with no fault or no sin against him. So what happens is some are being unrighteously judged with the word, and so their blood is waiting to be atoned for. Amen. Amen.